Marcus Miller's work. Marcus Miller uh, currently works at Google. Um, he is a person who has uh, guided uh, JavaScript. He's also, um, he did a late stage uh, PhD. And uh, before that, he was worked at a number of uh, uh, companies uh, and developed a number of languages. Um, so I'm going to need to be oops, pretty quick here. Um, this is, uh, I'm going to touch on, on the following themes. Um, hopefully, uh, security, containerization, and personal data. Uh, I think you'll need to read those into the subject matter that I'm going to cover because I'm going to cover technical subject matter. Um, so the, the problem is um, that uh, we need to turn JavaScript into an object capabilities language. So I'm going to describe what an object capabilities language is because that often is confusing. And, um, and then I'm going to um, give some examples of how you can turn your own code into secure code. And I'm also going to talk about some decentralized cyber risk because that's, um, that's the reason why you might want to secure your code. Okay. So a uh, little bit, I mentioned Mark briefly, but um, he's covered in, in, my, in my deck here. Uh, there's a number of uh, excellent uh, videos, uh, particularly the videos that Mark uh, provides uh, as short talks when he's presenting to the uh, standards committee that he is a, a part of, along with uh, other folks um, at, at companies that particularly that uh, the larger companies that contribute, and actually a few smaller ones that contribute to uh, JavaScript and the browser technologies. Um, Okay, let's see. So um, I ran into Mark last year in Vancouver, BC at Splash 2017. And uh, why I was there was I uh, became fascinated with uh, the ability to use JavaScript in uh, crypto commerce. So cryptocurrencies was all the uh, rage currently, or perhaps was more last year. But I became interested in using those same technologies for uh, hybrid business systems, in particular where we would um, perhaps extend a uh, software as a service to the edge, and we could do some processing at the edge, but we need to make that secure processing. Um, so um, I was... What I took away from this conference in particular was that uh, although there was a lot of new languages under development, um, to get a new language adopted is like a large exercise, to 10 years, maybe even, maybe even longer than that. So it turns out that a lot of good uh, work has been going on to, to make JavaScript uh, a, uh, a more secure language. Um, in particular, this takes us into two, two things that we need to um, understand more than, than is typically um, explained to developers. We, you know, we, we grab a, a framework like uh, React uh, or Angular, and we're off and running with that. But there's actually, um, by having a, a, a more thorough understanding of JavaScript, I think we can make better choices when we, um, when we make those uh, choices on, on frameworks. Okay. Um, so it turns out that uh, this is one of the things that I took away from this conference was that, uh, <clears throat> that the sh shared nothing languages, Erlang, Rust, Pony, um, and the uh, event loop languages, uh, JS, the one, the one E that Mark Miller invented, and a couple of others like Monty, um, these, these languages are much better candidates to, uh, for secure programming than, say, uh, Java. Java. Um, some folks, such as the uh, Rolang folks, are currently uh, using Java or Scala to, uh, to develop new smart contracting languages. And what they do is they basically take a 
um, a subset of Java and they reduce its surface area. But for fully fledged languages, these are our better candidates and we're going to talk more about JavaScript. Um, so this is a, a little bit of a background here to kind of like warm up. Um, the, this uh, concept of object capabilities is, um, is, is, is key to, to sort of grip this a little bit. So um, I like this example. I was struggling to explain this when I gave it. A I actually reprised Mark Miller's work, and Mark Miller was present in the room, which was kind of amazing because he's like brilliant and I'm not so brilliant. And um, and I struggled to explain this. He came up with this example of the passport versus the car key. So when we, um, if we were to like give somebody our car keys. All we've done is we've given them uh, permission to like drive around in our car. But if we were to give them our passport, then we've given them far greater authority. We've given them the ability to go across the border into Canada and somewhere else and basically assume our whole identity. They could, you know, take out credit and, and all sorts of other things. So those two are very different. Um, and it turns out that the way that most um, operating systems uh, especially uh, have been developed is um, they, they grant uh, too much authority and so here's, here's a quick example and I'll just try and do this by example so um, I think last year I was contacted by, uh, by Twitter because they had uh, apparently grant, I was using Twitter and I was also using something called TweetDeck and um, because Tweet, TweetDeck had a, a, a group policy, um, it turns out that somebody with that group policy, the TweetDeck, could actually also use my Twitter. So this was a, an, an email to say, hey, we've <coughs> somebody has your passport and can update your Twitter, and we would like you to like go and change your password or tighten up because... This is, uh, this is not okay. And if you can imagine that same scenario, take that to something like a credit card, that means that somebody that uh, in, your, in, your, in your arena uh, could perhaps access your, uh, your financial details. So this is just a social application. Okay, so, so a more spe specific um, is a capability is a thing that both designates a resource and authorizes some access to it. Um, Okay, I'm going to need to move a little bit quickly here. Okay, so uh, researchers have found that 90% uh, uh, up to 90% of applications may be vulnerable to, to some sort of hacks, ransomware, programming language, logic bugs, and smart contracts. And now we've got the speculative execution, sort of a trapdoor, which was inadvertently um, discovered in, in the um, Intel, Intel stack. So um, here's another quick example. Uh, so last year, I don't know if anybody uh, saw this one or came across and read about it, was Apple had the root password vulnerability, which uh, was kind of like scary because this meant that uh, if you're running High Sierra, um, somebody could get admin access to your machine. And so these, um, these, these issues that crop up in operating systems, we can also um, handle, another way to handle these or to make uh, our applications defensive is to implement what I'm, I'm going to talk about in, in, with JavaScript. Um, here's an example. I'm going to pass this one for now. Okay. Uh, this one I particularly like, and this is uh, when, when an application such as LinkedIn says, um, on my phone, Act, LinkedIn, allow LinkedIn to access photos, media, and files on your device. So, <clears throat> what does that really mean? Does that mean all my photos, all my media, and all, my, all the files on my machine? Um, it usually, the way the web's designed these days and mobile, those, those applications have been sandboxed. So, the app runs and it runs in a sandbox. But if there's something, for example, a, um, a sort of a, a, a glitch, such as the speculative execution, um, I, can actually, I can actually hop out of that sandbox 
into, into another application sandbox. And why that would happen was that, again, the operating system would have provided uh, more authority, like that passport type authority, instead of giving me the car keys. So it's... Okay, so now I think... Um, all right. Um, another quick example is that uh, when we're dealing with uh, GitHub, what we're able to do there as software developers is we're able to um, provide very specific authority. We're able to, to put some, um, some limits on who updates our, our, our Git repo. And so that's an example, I think, a working example, or sort of an abstract example of a, of a capability in a practical sense. All right, so now we're into JavaScript. So I, I am not a, a, an expert in JavaScript, so I just wanted to give enough JavaScript here to explain um, how Millet, Mark Millet came to some, some important reasoning, which has been driving JavaScript for about uh, 10 years. Um, and that is that uh, JavaScript um, is, uh, is a language which um, has a function in, in, a, in a return increment or in decrementer. And, um, okay. Okay. So, let me, um, let me just move on to this. So, what I'm going to try and talk about here is um, the internals, really, of, 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 of the, the functions in JavaScript. And so if you've worked with pointers in another language like C or, or, or any of the former languages, um, you, you dealt with pointers. And if we look what's going on here is this... Um, the pointer, we can count the number of ways that we can point between the different objects and, and we can grant authority. So how I designate these by endowment, um, I, and so what, what's really going on is that, um, let me move through these a little quickly here. Um, is that what object capabilities um, do is, is that um, I have um, th three, uh, three restrictions here. Okay. I have um, memory safety and encapsulation uh, effect, plus effects uh, uh, only held by references plus no powerful references by default. If I add those three together, then what I end up with, I end up with a reference graph, which is uh, covered in, in, in literature, that ends up being e equivalent to, to a perfect access graph. And that means that only connectivity begets connectivity and objective orientation expressiveness for security patterns, which, which are normally thought complex, actually end up being straightforward okay okay so um, another language that Mark Miller invented is a language called Dr. Sess and this is a, an important one because you can actually um, go and look up Dr. Sess on the on the internet and it's an overlay language for JavaScript and you can actually overlay your JavaScript with Dr. Sess and actually get this, um, this perfect reference graph, or which, which also pro provides a perfect access graph, which makes your code, um, in conjunction with um, strict mode, it makes your code secure, or defensive. Defensive is better. Um, okay. I think I have a duplicate um, slide here. But why this is important is that um, the frameworks that we're now dealing with um, 
we, would, we spoke about React in, in Angular a little bit earlier. The, one way to, to really um, to have a more uh, powerful application is to build an application using plugins. Um, I, I have a link in, in the deck further on, uh, which links to Ward Cunningham's new uh, federated wiki, which also uses plugins. Okay, so what does this mean like in sort of a, uh, a picture example? It means that uh, inside the browser, we have the uh, same origin iframes and um, one iframe can, can grant authority to another, uh, uh, another, another realm within that iframe. And um, it grants authority to its primordial and by doing this, um, I can actually confine the um, what's going on inside each of these inside each of these uh, realms. So the reason to point this out is that this realm. Um, by the way, Dr. S um, Dr. Sass stands for Distributed, Resilient, Secure ECMAScript. So this realm could actually be on a different server. It doesn't need to be on my own machine. So imagine we're dealing with some sort of IoT uh, endpoint. We may have like two IoTs. Uh, for example, uh, just a quickie example here. I have a friend who's, um, and they're kind of quite concerned that somebody could hack the uh, hydroelectric uh, dams, the controllers on those dams, and if there's one, one IoT is controlling one part of the dam, another IoT is controlling a different part of the dam, but I brought those together in a, in a control dashboard, then <clears throat> I need to make sure that, uh, that if somebody takes, uh, gains control of, of one of those endpoints, that, it, it co that malicious code can't <clears throat> Can't, uh, can't gain authority of another part of my application or, or my particular machine. Okay, so um, what do we mean by this? So what I mean by this is that um, as, uh, as functionality increases, we also need to increase safety. Okay, so... Um, Mark Millet, this should be a moving GIF. Sorry, my deck is on uh, speaker deck, which is not moving. Is a um, something called a, a Menger sponge, and what what a, what a Menger sponge allows me to do is to um, is to reduce is to use that as a concept to reduce my surface area. So I'm using Bob and Carol here and, and Alice to, to actually um, reduce uh, service area by using capabilities to, to give the least amount of authority, in other words, just my car keys and not my passport to, to Bob and Carol. Okay. So uh, how do I actually implement this? Um, in ECMAScript 5 came this new function called use strict. Um, and when I implement that, the objects uh, can defend them, their own integrity. Um, they can become properly defensive. And, um, and how I actually do this is there's actually something that's actually quite key here. And this is, uh, again, I'm going to rely upon uh, my deck here and perhaps some reading after the fact. It's got links into some, to some talks by Mark Miller. Is the, the, what's key is the, the initialization of, of each of those realms. So what I want to basically do is when I initialize a realm, I want to uh, initialize that realm and make sure that, that realm is, in, is initialized with strict so that um, that realm doesn't, um, is basically is, again, is, is only, I'm only granting access, the car keys to that, not, not, not the passport of capabilities. And this is, what's, um, this is what the overlay language Dr. Sess provides. Um, 
Dr. Sess, I don't think is going to become part of um, part of the JavaScript standard, but I'm going to talk about what is going to become part of the standard and why it's very influential in a moment, and you'll see how that comes together. Okay, uh, one quick thing here is when you actually implement strict mode, uh, this is part of ES5, uh, it's designed that, uh, that if you're upgrading all the code for any failed assignments that came from ES3, um, they, they're going to th throw in, so uh, the non ported functions, since they throw, you can catch them and, and fix, your, fix, your, fix the code. Um, I, what does it look like in code? This is something I worked on last year for this uh, website, uh, DevFest Seattle. Um, just, just here, here's my function. I can actually use strict at the function level. Um, I can use it on each function, or I can use it um, within a function. So this, in a very detailed sense, sometimes we can't always upgrade our code. Um, where can I use strict mode? Uh, so this is, you've seen this chart before, but this is, this is also changed. So strict mode now is, is pretty much supported across all browsers. Okay. Um, so I touched on this a little bit before in terms of multi-party computation and distributed systems. Um, okay. Here is a, um, an example from Salesforce. They, um, they, they had a um, challenge and, and they've actually, um, the way the new functionality gets into JavaScript is, is actually through, through the evolving into the standards. But the way the standards evolve is that people actually go ahead and actually implement uh, new capabilities. So Salesforce and a couple of other companies, Google, and have been working on something called Frozen Realms. And Frozen Realms is is the um, is a pending um, change to, to to JavaScript. Something we hope to see in there, and that will actually negate the need to put this overlay language Doctor Sess. Um, and you, you, the software developers are going to get this for free. But what this does is, let's kind of look at a little example here. Um, Salesforce, what their composition problem was, I think you can all imagine doing this, having to put the button, go and get the, the weather with a little map, and uh, going in and pulling some, some data out of the CRM system. They wanted to compose all those together. So imagine each one of these is, is a realm, or this would be a series of realms, and, but these are coming actually from different servers. So, since I, I, might not, I may not be able to like trust this particular CRM system, but I would like to build an application that actually presents this to my customer. How can I, how can I secure this? And so um, and here's another example of, this is, uh, I was gonna say this is Google Earth, but I think it's actually the web version of Google Earth. And this is actually cool because it's actually Again, this is open source, and it's out on GitHub. They, um, the the SAS plugins, the plugins for the for the web version have been upgraded to use to use the SAS. So each one of these each one of these plugins that composes, and then I believe that there's other information that can come from other servers onto this map, or you could you could add your own functionality to this, and you could make this very very secure. So if you're just you know, using it as a map, uh, no big deal. But if you were perhaps putting a little widget on there to do some e-commerce, you know, to sell like a hotel booking or something along those lines, that might be important. Or if you were using this, we're at uh, Bellingham Technical Community College, and they have a lot of uh, students here doing control systems work. If they're actually using this to manage the dams in Washington, and they wanted to make sure that uh, folks from uh, <coughs> somewhere else in the world weren't uh, tweaking and gaining access to that system to do some malicious harm to it, uh, this, this arrangement of plugins that have been secured um, by Secure ECMAScript would actually afford them uh, a, uh, 
security that from a uh, software development point of view we don't normally think about. We're just thinking, okay, let's just crank some stuff out in JavaScript. Okay. Um, sorry, I think I have a, a duplicate here or a, okay. <clears throat> uh, so Miller's got, I mentioned Miller's got some, uh, Mark Miller's got some very good talks. Here's a better one with this um, manager sponge. And um, changes to, uh, to JavaScript are going on all the time. So these, these of course, have landed. And uh, what's, what's also going on with JavaScript now is that uh, increasingly the language itself is, is, is becoming an object capabilities language. Now, let me try and give some um, specific Please go away, you're a hacker. <laughs> um, okay, so Millie did this late stage uh, PH, uh, PhD, you know, like, I don't know, late stage in life, not, not when he was like a young student, but late stage after he got a lot of experience. And uh, for the past te uh, 10 years, he's guided JavaScript. And there's actually been uh, four very important changes that have um, prepared JavaScript on top of Brandon Knight's work, who was originally writing JavaScript, to turn it into a, an, a, an object capabilities language. So this, um, this frozen realms, I mentioned uh, you, you could use this instead of uh, the Dr. Sess. Uh, just very recently, um, the uh, frozen realms had sort of been on the back burner because that sort of security that I've spoken about was like, I think the, the thinking there was a little bit ahead of where a lot of um, the, the larger community of software development is. The larger community is probably more interested in node applications and the standards, and that's kind of like, well, sort of has impedance with the standards folks. Whereas they're thinking more about the capabilities. But then along came uh, uh, Meltdown and Spectra. And that really requires that um, certain applications, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to make that application defensive itself, knowing that perhaps I'm running on, a, on, a, uh, on, on some sort of a stack that's got some sort of trap doors in it. So uh, Frozen Realms. Uh, is, is, is back on the uh, front, front burner, that would be a way to put it. There's actually a shim, uh, and you can actually uh, implement that shim yourself. You can actually even try the shim out here. So you can actually just drop some JavaScript into that and just run it, um, which, is pr which, which is pretty nice. I was going to do that, but um, not, on a, uh, not on a Chromebook. Um. So, um, and then just, just I, I've given this talk before and actually I, prov I provided Mark an ability to, uh, to review my work, um, which is actually his work, but this is complicated stuff. And he said, just to clarify, strict mode is one of several elements added in ES5 along with object freeze, get up, own property names that make CES possible as a library and the JS strict mode by itself doesn't turn JS into an object cake system. You still need a library such as CES or the upcoming Frozen Realm shim. And so with that, with that knowledge, if you're working on, on a complex application such as some like dam monitoring or uh, some complicated e-commerce where you're composing uh, in a plugin arrangement and working across other servers or you're involved with the uh, crypto commerce world, world where you're dealing with decentralized servers and you don't know if you can trust that node. This is important uh, that you know about this so you can make good choices about your when building your, your applications. Um, oh yeah, so a little bit of a, an aside here. Um, so I've been collaborating with uh, Wood Cunningham uh, 
and <coughs> we've been thinking uh, and doing experiments and actually making small plugins to federated wiki which would uh, al um, allow us to implement um, SAS and frozen realms. It actually, at this time, it actually implements something called Kaha, which again is another language that uh, Miller invented. And um, Kaha, I, I associate that more with uh, sort of like the open social uh, technologies around about like 2008, 2009. They were in, uh, MySpace adopted them, um, Google adopted them. In fact, actually Google still uses Kaha in certain uh, applications. So what, what Kaha does is it actually sanitizes the, um, sanitizes the uh, JavaScript from, um, from other components. So, so when I compose an application, such as a social application, perhaps Open Social would compose uh, MySpace and say some Facebook data. And we all know recently what happened uh, with Cambridge Analytica why that's important because you perhaps don't want to give authority to your application to do so scraping or something along those lines. You want to, to restrict that type of data access, which you can do. Okay. Okay, where, else, where am I going with this? Okay. Um, so, um, so, this also um, this also has um, touches on on scaling. So in the same way that um, that that I can build a frozen realm for security purposes, I can also build a frozen realm and use this for scaling. This is kind of fairly new work, and this is important because. Uh, lots and lots of people are trying to figure out how to make blockchain and, uh, and smart contracts scale uh, and deal with high levels of throughput. And so the, the key issue here is that if you've got a global block, then, then you've also got a global block. And um, to, to put that into some, uh, perhaps some practical, I asked Ward, does Wiki, which is federated Wiki, um, deliberately avoid global locks by design? And the word was yes, but, um, Wiki enables collective behavior without any synchronization at the application level. So that's, uh, that's, a, that's a key here, and a key, a key takeaway to actually implement um, JavaScript, SAS, or frozen realms to, to, to build out applications that don't actually lock lock up. Um, oh yeah. Okay. Um, okay, since we're at Linux Fest, it's uh, getting close to the, the finish here. Um, a new capability, which is also being fostered by, by Google, is, is actually in Linux itself, is the Linux uh, Control Groups API which is very capability-like. This is like about 10 years worth of work and all sorts of folks from Intel and, and others have been involved with this. Um, so it actually allows the Linux kernel itself to move to a security model that is similar to an object capability model. Um, and so, so what, I, what I can actually do is, even though I've got a... Uh, a uh, perhaps a, a, uh, a microprocessor that might um, have a, be vulnerable to, to a hack like uh, Spectre and Meltdown, what I can also do is I can implement this API and I can restrict access to, um, to the VM or to the application which is actually running on Linux. Then what I can also do is I can restrict access within the application that I'm building through JavaScript. So we're beginning to see the stack itself change to uh, object capabilities from them um, all the way through, through, the, through the stack. Okay, so 
this was me trying to make a joke here. I hope that someone gets my message in a bottle. <laughs> and um, uh, so in summary, um, web developers can implement JavaScript in strict mode now to improve current apps. Um, more, app, more capabilities are slated for ECMAScript with frozen realms. Uh, capabilities can enforce uh, procedures within the company. For example, say, user A can only access X document without approval or with approval from user B and C. Uh, in respect to trust, it allows companies to ensure procedures are being executed in compliance with regs. Uh, smart contracts can automate the, these procedures. And working uh, with blockchain technologies, perhaps uh, it's also a, a proxy uh, for securing uh, crypto commerce by addressing uh, process trust and access. And with that, I may have time for some questions. I don't know. So that's my contacts, and that's the deck will be up on, is actually up on speaker deck. Um, so happy to uh, try and uh, field some questions. Also happy, like, if anybody else wants to uh, um, address anything else. Yeah. Thanks. Is, is there any special considerations for WebSockets coming into, into from the outside world making a secure connection between a, a device, say an IoT device, and the Okay, so I think this comes to, um, let me think if I have a picture, picture to explain that. The thing is, like, with, with JavaScript is that JavaScript is not like um, a, a language such as C++ that allows you to really mess with anything. It, it doesn't provide access directly to the, to the I.O., okay? So um, it's always going to use um, an, in, an intermediary um, a function to provide that. So I don't think there is anything special there. What is special is that, um, no, I, I don't think I can answer it any further than that. The notice say that JavaScript doesn't give access directly. And that's actually one of its key, um, that's one of the key reasons to use JavaScript is because it doesn't give access, you know, at, at the, you know, at the, at the, I believe that's correct, at the socket level. In other words, I've always got to go through a function and I can secure that function. I can put strict around that function. Yeah. I think that's said correctly. Yeah. Anybody else for more? Hi, Eric. Yeah. Um, I, sorry, I missed a lot of the presentation, so I just made it covered. Um, and it's kind of a difficult question, but as you see the, the web move towards object-capable like web apps and whatnot, um, how do you see that changing the internet? How do I see it changing the internet? Yes. <clears throat> I see it changing the internet. Um, okay, currently the large internet companies, Google, Amazon, uh, Microsoft, we're kind of in a sort of a comfy mode where a lot of um, a lot of us trust those large companies with all our security. We just got to build an application, a cloud application, and um, and then we we hand over security to those folks. Uh, where I see uh, it, the, the internet changing is if we want to uh, perhaps have some of that control back for ourselves. You know, we're, we would like to have an operating system. We would like to deploy a server somewhere, and we'd like to build a, a complicated application on that. And we need to, um, in, in, in particular, perhaps, we would like to, to uh, operate with other folks in maybe a supply chain or, um, a, a, I wouldn't say like a social network, but in some, something that looks like a graph of folks. And it's possible quite possible that we don't know everybody inside that environment. In other words, we don't know their username and password. We're not a Google, we're not an Amazon, we're not sort of a, but, but we, have, uh, we have reason to 
to, 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 to interact with other folks without actually knowing exactly who they are. So for example, if we would, had a small business and we were dealing with uh, some suppliers overseas, um, and we were to say, okay, I, I, I don't want to use email, I don't want to use fax, and any of those things, what I'd actually like to do is to build an application that actually connects to somebody else's business application, then uh, that's where I think the internet's going to change and these technologies come in place, either you know, strip the JavaScript that I've described or you know, JavaScript carried on into, into crypto commerce and distributed, um, distributed systems. Yeah. So I, it's a, in a way, I think it's, I don't know if it's, I see it really aligned with Linux because it's giving us the freedom to, to, to build applications without having to go to, to a large cloud to do that. Um, yeah. Nobody here from Amazon, though. <laughs> Sponsored. Well, thanks very much for uh, being a great audience. Really appreciate it. <laughs> By the way, this is just a taster. I'm going to put the deck up there. There are specific talks on pretty much every one of these bullets here. So if you're particularly interested in, in a, you know, drilling into this and really understanding this, because you need to deploy some of this for your applications, uh, Miller is a very succinct speaker and a wonderful teacher. Thanks. Thank you.